this is the only the third time we've ever seen an interstellar object. And interstellar doesn't just mean Matthew McConaughey. It means something not from our solar system. It's interstellar. It's between suns. It began as a faint irregularity. One streak, then another, picked up on routine survey frames and flagged not for drama, but for being consistent. Within days, four independent observatories, working different latitudes, instruments, and nights, reported fast, faint objects moving against background stars with proper motions that didn't fit the usual near-Earth catalogs. The first impulse was to assume overlap. Duplicate detections of the same body or software mesociations in crowded star fields. But as raw frames were exchanged and astrometric solutions rerun against Gaia Doctor 3, the solution tightened instead of falling apart. What remained were four distinct tracks with independent plate solutions, consistent timestamps, and residuals small enough that, even before any conclusions, the message was simple. These were real. From the moment the Minor Planet Center issued a call for confirmation, teams did what they always do when something interesting appears. They tried to break it. Clocks were checked, NTP synced where available, Jeeps disciplined where not. Bias, dark and flat frames were reapplied from scratch. Every field was re-reduced with different pipelines, astrometry, net for plate solving, astroimagage and photo utils for aperture photometry, CCD proc or ERAF recipes for calibration, to see if a single software assumption was fooling everyone. When the measurements agreed within the stated uncertainties, attention shifted to geometry. Each object carried its own track, brightness and skyplane velocity, yet the extrapolated trajectories threaded the same narrow band that crossed Earth's orbital plane, not parallel, not collinear, but phasing through a corridor that looked less like chance and more like resonance. For context, interstellar doesn't mean dramatic, it means specific. It means an osculating eccentricity greater than one, a hyperbolic path unbound to our sun, and an asymptotic inbound speed that cannot be explained by distant perturbations within the Kuiper belt or Uit cloud. Historically, we've confirmed only three such visitors. One I slash Aumuamua in 2017 with its non-gravitational acceleration and no detectable outgassing. Two I slash Borisov in 2019, a more textbook comet and 3i Atlas cataloged later, still of interest for its composition. Seeing four candidates arrive in the same observing season is statistically uncomfortable. That is why the analysis in this story leans into methods first and interpretation second. The first body to lock in was small and unmissably green under spectroscopy. C2025P1's emerald signature came from C2 emission, diatomic carbon fluorescing under solar UV. That alone isn't rare, but its intensity curve climbed too quickly for a nucleus its inferred size. Aperture photometry, annuli carefully chosen to avoid contaminating stars, showed an exponential brightening where a slower, near-linear trend was expected. Radar echoes, where available, suggested a compact, mechanically strong core, unusual though not impossible. When its preliminary orbit was fit from a week of positions, the solution intersected the same gravitational corridor the others seem to share. A coincidence is easy to accept once. Four are harder. The second object, a known long-period comet, returned brighter than its ephemeris predicted and carried a tail so extended that even conservative estimates placed the dust length on the order of tens of millions of kilometers. That by itself can happen, comet surprise. But the photometry showed smoother symmetry than ordinary jet-driven fans, and the spectra reported elevated neutral sodium and iron lines earlier than models preferred. Neither is a smoking gun. Both ask for a mechanism. The least speculative reading is internal heterogeneity, pockets of material venting, in a way that mimics gentle course keeping when averaged over hours. To keep trust intact, that is as far as we can responsibly go. The third, C2023 Athrit Suchinchen, Atlas, behaved like a lesson in careful language. Its light curve didn't wander, it pulsed. A periodicity near nine hours, derived with a long Scargill periodogram to handle uneven sampling, kept reappearing across independent datasets. Binary nuclei can produce repeating signatures, and a two-component core is not unheard of. What was unusual was how clean the signal stayed as seeing conditions, filters, and instruments changed. 
Even its tail appeared to prefer fixed bends over smooth curvature under solar wind pressure, as if the dust was shaped by something other than the straightforward radiation and field environment. Again, there are natural explanations worth exhausting. Grain size distributions with large, slow to turn over particles, viewing geometry, transient field structures, but it is the discipline of the signal that keeps the discussion open rather than closed. The fourth object, 2024 or 4, was nearly invisible optically and presented primarily as radar backscatter, a compact, irregular body rotating roughly every nine hours. Metallic hints in the radar albedo, nickel, cobalt, iridium signatures, should not be overinterpreted. They indicate higher radar reflectivity consistent with metal-rich regolith, not refined alloy. Still, paired with a tiny orbital adjustment that survived attempts to attribute it to radiation pressure or typical Yarkovsky effects, it drew attention. When four bodies of differing brightness, composition, and observability phase through the same orbital window within days, even the cautious start asking whether they share more than timing. Stacking all four trajectories in a heliocentric frame produced alignments that repeated, triangles, near-orthogonal crossings, and phase-lock spacing that looked like geometry, until you remember celestial mechanics loves resonances. To avoid storytelling beyond the data, the term that stuck internally was harmonic corridor, not a claim of intent, but a description that their osculating elements repeatedly fell into patterns that conserved timing relationships over the weeks they were followed. When teams ran the orbits backward with Monte Carlo spreads on initial conditions, the nominal paths converged toward a low radiation pressure region beyond the heliopause. That doesn't prove origin. It does say the least assumption extrapolation points there. Throughout, the discipline was to separate what instruments measured from what people hoped to conclude. Photometry reported magnitude changes with error bars. Spectroscopy listed lines with strengths normalized by calibration lamps. Astrometry recorded right ascension and declination with uncertainties driven by centroid fits against Gaia reference stars. Where magnetometers were consulted, the global indices, KP, DSD, I showed periods of quiet to unsettled conditions without the kind of solar events, CMS or X-class flares, that would neatly explain transient upper atmosphere effects. Ionospheric total electron content maps did show patches of variability coincident with some passes, but correlation is cheap, causation is expensive, and nobody claimed it without caveats. As the objects approached the orbital window, where their paths crossed the plane of Earth's motion, coordination shifted from curiosity to procedure. Radar tracked whenever geometry allowed. Imaging cadences were increased, exposure scripts adjusted to avoid trailing at the observed skyplane rates. Data was submitted in FITS format with full UCS headers, so reduction could be replicated anywhere. When brightness bumps appeared, analysts checked for cosmic ray hits and satellite glints. When they persisted across frames and instruments, they stayed in the record. Where periodicity stood out, teams published their window functions alongside power spectra so others could see aliasing risks rather than take results on trust. During the peak week, one event did stand above noise a short-lived, wide-area auroral enhancement at latitudes that don't often see it, without a coincident solar driver. Radio systems reported brief HF disturbances. NSS users logged small phase slips. None of it proved a connection to the inbound bodies. All of it justified keeping the instruments on. The most conservative synthesis was that the magnetosphere was perturbed by something not obviously solar. Whether that something relates to four small bodies phasing through a corridor is a hypothesis, not a result. Then the part that good scripts usually rush past, losing them. As often happens with small, fast movers, geometry worsened. Phase angles became less favorable, backgrounds more crowded, signal-to-noise fell. The radar windows closed as distances grew and cross-sections shrank. It felt like an ending. The measured truth is simpler. They fell below practical detectability. Official summaries noted no hazard, no impacts, no debris fields, and no new sustained radio sources. That is not a mystery. It is the normal outcome when faint targets leave our best zones for tracking. So what remains once the headlines fade? Four well-documented tracks through a narrow orbital window, 
One green, one long-tailed, one likely binary, one dark and radar bright. A recurring tilde nine-hour periodicity in at least two light curves and one rotation estimate. Spectra that at times emphasized sodium and iron more than simple water-dominated models prefer. Timing relationships that looked like resonances rather than pure chance, though the sample size guarantees caution. An upper atmosphere blip with poor causal attribution. And a lot of raw data, preserved, time-stamped and available to be re-reduced as methods improve. If you are watching to hear that someone confirmed intent, you won't hear it here. The discipline position is stronger. What was observed is worth attention because it survives the obvious failure modes, clock drift, plate solve errors, poor flats, single site artifacts. The most powerful part of the story isn't a conclusion, it is the process. Multiple sites, multiple instruments, independent reduction, shared calibration, reproducible curves, posted residuals. The signal of seriousness is transparency, and that may be the quiet legacy of this episode. Not that four visitors arrived together, but that observers treated an unlikely alignment with skepticism first and still found enough coherence to keep looking. That the phrases used, synchronous resonance, possible interobject correlation, harmonic, chosen because they describe patterns without smuggling in intent, that we don't know was said out loud more often than not, and that, here's exactly how we measured it followed. If there is a message embedded anywhere in this, it's not in a frequency or a flare, it's in a method, Look, measure, publish your reduction steps, state uncertainties, separate what instruments saw from what minds inferred and keep your priors light. Whether these were four interstellar bodies sharing a fortuitous corridor, or a resonance we don't yet model well, or simply the tale of a probability distribution we rarely sample, the way forward is the same. Better cadence, better coverage, better humility. For now, the sky is quiet again. The corridor, if that's what it was, is empty at least at our current sensitivity. The records are not. And if those nine-hour rhythms show up again in some other visitor, some other season, we'll have a baseline, a method, and a community ready to test it. Until then, the most honest ending is also the most compelling. Four small travelers crossed our neighborhood with timing that challenged our expectations. We measured carefully, we learned a little, and we left the door open for the next piece of evidence to change the story. That is not just good science, that's how you earn trust. 